So um, in about four weeks or five weeks, I'm going to be preaching on Noah. All this week is just preparation uh, for you. we got a sermon coming up sometime in late June about uh, Noah and all of that. So just for the next 40 days. <laughs> and, if all, and if you're a righteous person, you have nothing to worry about, right? So we're good. Just get ready for that sermon. Uh, also, it's all read today. It, it's the day of Pentecost. Today is the day that we celebrate the birth of the church. In Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes down and the church begins. And uh, there's another sermon series I'm working on for the fall about the, the creed, uh, the church uh, apostles' creed, and, and what do we believe. And so I've been listening to a podcast that's great. I love it. You'll probably hate it. So don't take this as, hey, listen to this podcast. It's called The History of the Christian Church. People like me geek out on this. Y'all probably won't. But what was real interesting to me is listening to this podcast, and currently I'm in the 300s and 400s, is all the whining and complaining of church members and the criticizing of each other on how we worship and what we worship and all that kind of stuff taking place 13, 1400 years ago, 1500 years ago. Uh, people struggling with, well, is God this or is God this? And, and all the politics and things that come into play that we in today faith go, well, this is our faith. This is what we believe. Well, 1,800 years ago, or 1,500 years ago, and they were critical and backstabbing of each other, and it made me realize that on the day that we celebrate the birth of the church, hey, for 2,000 years, humanity has been trying to mess it up, uh, but God's love and God's spirit still works in and amongst and, and through the church, and so uh, we celebrate that, the church and all of its imperfections, and still uh, God I is at work, and so today, we're going to continue our series we started last week on my big fat mouth something I'm an expert in, uh, work, working on because our words matter. How we use our words, what we say about our words, uh, it says a lot about us, and it makes a difference in, in the world uh, around us. We want to speak words of truth and words of love and, and words of grace because that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is just a lie. Um, and so I gave you a memory verse last week, and before they put it up, does anybody just remember what the verse was? Judy Bearfield, I will buy you coffee out there in the lobby. <laughs> Let you know, Thursday night, it was crickets, right? It, uh, and I, I was, this is a hard verse to memorize, but, I, but I'd love for you to memorize. I'd say it's a hard verse to memorize. Some of you are going, every verse is hard. This one's got some tongue twisters to it, and it's about the tongue, but this is the verse. Let's say it together. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. I mean, your tongue is going to get you into trouble. Every one of us in this room can talk about a moment in our life where we said something or we did something and we're like, oh, Right? And, and it was just one word or one phrase or one statement and everything. And you can all point to relationships that are like a wildfire. Just one little spark. Somebody said something, somebody did something, and everything is, is destroyed. We, we worry a lot about our body parts in today's world and culture with sexuality. But the Bible speaks more about what you do with your tongue gets you into more trouble than any other part of your body. Just the words you're saying, because sticks and stones may break my bones, but words really, really hurt. How did you do on complaining last week? Oh, that was good. That was excellent, people. All right, one, one of the things we talked about last week was, hey, do a complaint jar. I'm only $11 in. Um, I, I was $11 into my complaint jar. It was, it was we paid a dollar every, every complaint, giving it all to uh, resources uh, uh, to women. Um, I, the, uh, yeah. It's hard, all right? But, I mean, but it's a retraining of your brain. It's a retraining of your thoughts. The worst one for me was last, it was Sunday of last week. I mean, I just preached a sermon, and then I had to drive to Ocala, and that's Granada all the way for 60 miles. And literally, I'm at the gas station, and I pull in because there was no gas in the car, my wife's car, and I pull in the gas station, and every pump was full, and then I got right behind the guy that was taking the pump out and putting it in. I'm like, sweet, he's leaving, and I got behind him, and he went in the bathroom, and evidently he had some gastrointestinal issues because he was in there for a while, and the whole time, man, I am not complaining. I'm just like, oh, Jesus, you were testing me. This is a test. This is a test. And we get to my sister's house, and I'm there, and it is 
freezing in her house. And I said, y'all can hang meat in here. I'm going outside to warm up. And Jacob goes, that's a dollar. <laughs> you, you, you re, you, you've got to retrain your brain. You've got to work on your words. Because what would we do with our words matter? Because sticks and stones may break my bones, but words really hurt. And today I kind of want to step it up a notch where we get a little, a little deeper in how we use our words. It's going to get a little harder. Because today um, I want to talk about criticism. And folks have said, well, what's the real goal of this series? Now, some of y'all are being critical. What, why are you preaching this series? The goal for me is this. I would love for your words to reflect God's love. That all of our words, whenever we speak, that the words coming out of our mouth are reflecting the love of God that is in our hearts. Paul talks about that a lot about be, in, in the New Testament. Be transformed on the inside and, and let, it, let it come out. That, that the goal of this series would be to reflect God's love. And talking about that today, being, being critical. Using words that criticize and demean and devalue. And I'm not talking about offering constructive feedback. Okay, but let me be clear. You know when you can offer constructive feedback? When you have permission. There are only two times in your life you can ever give somebody feedback, cr critical or uncritical. It's when they come to you and say, hey, I need some advice, I need some help, can you, can you, can you share with me how I can do better? At that moment, you can share things, but even then being critical, let's try to be a little bit kind and nice and loving. Or if you go to them and say, hey, I've been thinking about some things, I'd love to share some advice with you. And if they say, yeah, I'd love to hear that, then you have the ability to share something. All right? I'm not talking about that. By the way, if they go no... Don't share. All right? Um, and, and, it's, and, and so uh, just, you know, just a little personal aside. You know, when you come outside of the preacher after the church service is over, you say, hey, can I give you some feedback on your sermon? Sure. <laughs> All right? I'm not talking about the constructive criticism when you have permission. I'm, I'm talking about the criticism that, that is kind of the nitpicking and the nagging and the poking at a little bit and, and, and just kind of digging at people, the unfair, bi your biased critique of what they're doing, what they're wearing, what they're saying, that it's, it's unkind kind of stuff. And some of you right now are going, oh, sweet Jesus, I am so glad my spouse is here. <laughs> they need to hear this today. And, and some of you are like, oh, I wish my parents were here. I wish my kids were here. Or some of you are like, ooh, I'm going to download this and send it to my boss. This will be good for her to hear, right? <laughs> right? And that, that's the trouble with criticism. We are keenly aware of when somebody is being critical to us. We are keenly aware of when somebody is nitpicking us and somebody is nagging us and when somebody is just booking at us about it. We're really aware of that, but, but we have no clue when we're doing it ourselves. Because, see, we're not being critical. We're being helpful. Right, our words are meant to help, right? Because we know that God has a plan for their life, and so do we. And when God, when they're not living up to God's plan, when they're not living up to the expectations that we have for them, when they aren't measuring up, we feel like it's our job to make sure they're aware of that and let them know, you chose to wear that to church today? Really? Hmm. You think that color looks good on you? Oh, you did that with your hair because you're ordering that and I thought you were losing weight, right? Huh. Oh, you have, you, 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 uh, you're going on that vacation and you're struggling with money because I know what I got for Christmas, so obviously you don't have much, <laughs> right? Well, one of my favorites I get occasionally from uh, folks in, in my family is, hey, does, is your phone okay? And I'm like, yeah, why? Oh, it just never works with us. <laughs> you know, just kind of, I'm, I'm talking about the, those those, those kind of moments that are so hurtful. And we're like, no, 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 no. See, they're just moments that we're trying to be helpful. And, and we, we know we just, we just, we just want to help them be a better person. And if they weren't so stupid, or if they had fashion sense, or if they just spend their money wisely, we would not have to be dealing with this, but we're just trying to encourage them uh, along the way. Paul writes uh, this in, in Galatians. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love for the entire law. Oh, That's what I love about Paul. Paul takes the Old Testament, boom, just steals from Jesus. One Old Testament, one phrase. The entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor 
Let me just stop you right there. That may be why we're so critical. Love your neighbor. How critical are you to yourself? I thought about this after I preached this Thursday night. So don't just hear this about being critical with folks around you. Think about the words you're saying about yourself, how critical you are to yourself, how hard, how hard you are uh, on yourself. One of the things y'all may not understand, I watch my sermons every week. I don't know how y'all sit here. Because there are moments I'm like, good Lord, what are you doing? The camera switching back and forth. There was a time I touched my nose. It felt like I would never take communion because I kept touching my nose. Every, my wife's like, you're always rubbing on your chest. I've got issues. I will. And then I'm like, you said what? That's not even proper English. That's not even good southern English, right? And I can just find myself. I can rip that sermon apart like that. And then I go to a Bible study and they help even more. I mean, it's just... It's, just wonderful, right? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Lighten up on being critical with yourself, folks. Uh, can we put that scripture back up for me, uh, Susan? You, no, the one before that? There you go. No? Yeah. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let's keep reading. If you bite and devour each other. Watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. I love what Paul says in this scripture. And I, I, the more I'm studying, the more I get about Paul in the New Testament, Paul seems to be real clear. God loves you, and I, I'll throw in, God loves you, period. Now live like it. Understand God loves you, now live that way. Live, live as though God loves you. And as you begin to live that life, you begin to transform who you are. As you begin to reflect Christ to this world, who you are should begin to change because of God's love in, in your life. And Paul's like, look, love one another as you love yourself. And quit, quit biting and devouring each other. And it made me think, that nitpicking, that nagging, just, it's like, yip, 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 made me think of those little dogs. And I know some of y'all have little dogs, and Jesus loves you for that, all right? <laughs> Not being critical. But I'm not a little dog kind of guy. I mean, my, I'm like, you know, and we got this little dog in our neighborhood. And if you live in the trails, it may be your dog, and Jesus loves you too. Um, but that little dog's always like, yee, 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 the whole time. And I'm like, I'm going to turn Scout loose one day and solve that problem, right? Because it's just, nee, 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 And just, boy. Someone, when, when sometimes constantly nagging on you, picking on you, critical of you, and all those little things digging at you. Just takes chunks out of you. And it destroys relationships. Because sooner or later, just like me with that little yippity yippy dog, I'll turn my dog loose and just, right? And what happens sometimes with criticizing is you keep nagging, you keep nagging, you keep nagging, and I'll blow up. Or I'll just stop being around you. Or worse. I'll begin to believe that's who I am. Because we bite and devour each other and we nag at each other and we are so hypercritical of each other, some of us are destroying the intimacy in our marriages. Some of us are creating a wedge between us and our children. And some of us aren't able to share the love of Jesus with the people around us because everybody knows us as the negative one in the room that constantly is poking and pointing out everybody's faults. What we do with our words matter. What if God was as critical of you as you are of others? What if God nitpicked you, nagged you like you nag other people? What if God was constantly going, ah, what did you wear to church today? Really? Huh. That's what you put in the offering plate? Interesting. Couldn't memorize one scripture passage. <laughs> oh, that's not God anymore. I'm sorry. I kind of <laughs> took, a, took a turn. Took a turn on that. What, what, what if God kept poking at you? Aren't you glad God doesn't do that? 
You don't have to be this way. We don't have to constantly be critical. It is not our job to solve the world and fix everybody's problem and to point out all the stuff they were doing wrong. Anybody watch a wedding yesterday? I don't get that for the life of me, but good for y'all. I love some of the Facebook comments about dresses and hats and all that kind of stuff. We'll be running the same critique here this week. We'll post online your, right? I mean, think about some of the ways we're critical, not just in the words we say, but what we post and what we do. You, you don't have to be that way. There are some people in this world who are critical and poke and nag and just point out all the things wrong. Then there are other people that fill you with hope and with joy and they give you words of encouragement and build you up. Paul talks about that too in Ephesians. Paul says this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Let's leave that up for a second, Susan. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Now, this most of the times I've ever heard this scripture passage, Mama used this scripture passage a lot with me, is there are certain words you shouldn't say, right? You know the words, right? We won't list them out, but you don't let any unwholesome talk, that those are the words. I don't know if that's what Paul meant here, because Paul didn't have the same words we use today. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. I mean, think about the words you're saying. Are, you, are your words encouraging? Are they building people up? Are, are they meeting their needs? Are, are you speaking words into their life that are that give life, not death? What kind of words are you using? Paul's like, don't let any... Uh, and if you keep reading in, in this passage in Ephesians, Paul's going to start going, get rid of. He's going to tell you, you can do it. Get rid of all that anger and malice and slander. He's going to start saying, you can get rid of it. We're like, no, no, I need God to get rid of it. And God's like, uh-uh, that's your job. You can work on it. You can retrain your mind. You can train yourself. You can work on using good words that build people up. Because your words have the power of life and death. That's what the proverb says. The tongue has the power of life and death. You know that, don't you? You ever, you ever, you ever have a moment where somebody just cut you with their words and how you felt after that? At the same time, has anybody ever said a positive word to you? You have, and just, you have no idea the effect of how negative words, critical words, criticizing words to people, what effect that has on their life. How you can say words to people and it just sort of sucks the life right out of them because you begin, to, you, you nitpick and you nag and you, and they just, and like I said, either they begin to blow up worse they begin to believe because it is it just wears them down you are constantly on them about you are bad you are bad you are bad you're not good that da, 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 da. and all of a sudden they begin to believe they transform it from the negative critical words to that's just who i am and they lose themselves but at the same time you can find moments where somebody's spoken to your life words of encouragement hope where somebody said something to you, and you're like, and it just lifted your spirit. For me, I can vividly remember, vividly, it is one of those moments that is etched in my brain, Miss Gilly, when I was in the first grade. I turned in a paper, and I don't know what it was for, but I got a C on it. And I remember Miss Gilly calling me up, and she says, Scott Smith, can you come up here? And I'm like, okay, you know. And I go up there, and she goes, hey, you got a C on this paper. I'm like, yes, ma'am. And she went, and she goes, Scott Smith, you are so much better than this. She goes, you are so smart. You are so talented. I can't, you, you, would, you should never turn in a C. That just, you, you're better. And she didn't say a critical negative word. She just kept putting into my life that I, how good I was. I have always remembered that. It has made a difference in my life forever because of one thing a first grade teacher said to me. At the same time, one of my most embarrassing moments that I still regret and will, I'm sure God's going to remind me of, and I'll, eh. there was a moment on the soccer field when I was the coach, and I actually screamed out, you are sucking up the oxygen that a good player needs. <laughs> she was 13, so I thought she was mature enough to handle that, <laughs> right? <laughs> it was not a good moment. And I could see, you know, and immediately I was like, hey, I'll, I'll <laughs> I'm the pastor, and I, you know, and I you know, apologize, but man, you can't take them back, can you? And we all say, oh, I didn't mean to say that, 
you did, you just didn't mean for us to hear it. You, you never know when the words you're using, are they building somebody up or tearing somebody down? What's your role in this? What kind of person do you want to be? I can, fault finder or hope dealer? I borrowed this from, a, I saw a sermon another guy preached, and he used this terminology. I thought it was really good. You want to be a fault finder or a hope dealer? Fault finder, that's our go-to. That's, what, that's our natural, that's who we are. We instinctively, for whatever reason in humanity, we go to being a fault finder. We want to point out what's wrong. We, why is it we always see the bad before the good? Why is it we can be so critical of all kind of things and begin to point out? I did it last night at a restaurant. And my son, I'm, I'm not going out, I'm not going to hang out with Jacob much more. <laughs> we're, we're at the restaurant. We had already gone to one restaurant. It was a 45-minute wait. I'm like, I ain't waiting 45 minutes. It ain't going to be that good. And we went to another restaurant, and we sat down, and we're ordering, and, and, and we, we got the chips and the salsa, which is always nice. And maybe four minutes had gone by. And I'm like, if he don't get here soon, we're out of here. I ain't waiting much longer. And Jacob goes, really? Cause the, and, then, and then the guy gets there, and he's like, well, would you like to drink? And we order our drinks. And, and he goes, all right, I'll be back. And I'm like, I ain't going to stay here much longer. I ain't gonna run. And Jacob's like, you've been here five minutes, and you've determined already. What? I'm like, that's what the studies show. Really? He goes, what studies? And I'm like, well, all the church growth studies I do say they have made a decision to whether or not they're going to come back to your church within the first seven minutes. I haven't even gotten up yet in seven minutes. What's the deal, right? right? But I realized, man, just like that, I was already pointing out all the things that were wrong. Do you know how easy that is? Just to critically point out, here's what's wrong, here's what's wrong, here's what's wrong. Here's, that's our now. Why is it we look for what's wrong before we look for what's right? Why is it? We can point out the thing, and if you just think about it, we point out, the, here's this, 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 you need to work on. You did really well on this and this. Right? Think about how you talk to your children. Here, 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 here. Oh, yeah, you're good here. Or your spouse. Or drivers on the road. Or waiters. Or church services. I, why do you start with the bad? I think there are a couple reasons we do. One, um, and this is going to be hard for you to hear, and it's hard for me to say, but Daddy told me if it steps on your toes, move them. It's because we're insecure. Somehow we feel better about ourselves by putting others down. That is sick, but we all do it. That somehow me pointing out what's wrong with you makes me feel better about myself. I, I, I don't know why when we get in groups of humanity, we like to pick on other people and nitpick a little bit and eh, as though that elevates us. But we do it. I think also it, it, it's um, a reflection of we think the world needs to be this way and we're right. That this is how you should be and this is how the world should be. And if you're not lining up the way I understand the world to be, let's just throw politics or weddings. If you're not doing the way, you know, because what they did yesterday. Anyhow, all right. If you're not the way I want to be, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure it's all about that our way is the right way kind of thing. And, and that ties into that complaining thing, why complaining is so important. We are training ourselves to see the negative. The more we complain, the more we see negative. The more, we, the more negative we are, the more it just kind of keeps cycling until that's all we ever see. And because we only see the negative, you never know the other side of the story. That person you're looking at going, really, that's what you chose to wear to church today? And that may be the very best thing they own? Or that person you're like, at, she just needs to lose some weight and things will be better. And you have no idea the thyroid issue or the medical condition she's wrestling with. So easy to be a fault finder. Paul tells us, y'all need to love each other the way God loves you. He 
So the other side is don't be a fault finder, be a hope dealer. And I use that terminology real well. I like the dealer part because it kind of sounds like, ooh, subversive, you know, like you're a drug dealer kind of thing, right? Right? Y'all are going to remember that, people. Think about it. Because th- isn't hope a drug? I mean, doesn't it change how you feel about yourself? When somebody gives you a compliment, when somebody says, hey, that was a great job, when somebody says, I love you, when somebody says, you look great today, doesn't that just boom? Pay attention to how you feel in that moment. Be one of those dealers. Let people know. Instead of po- pointing out all the things that are wrong, start saying, hey, here's, here's some, I, I love this. I, I came up with some phrases you need to just learn to say. I love you. I mean, seriously, you, you cannot say that phrase enough. Because I, 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 I will tell you, I know of numerous couples where one of them says, they, they haven't said they love me in years. I actually had one guy said, well, she knows I love her. I married her. That is a direct quote. Guess what they're not? Married still. <laughs> right? I love you. You know, I'm, I'm proud of you. Do you know how much people need, I'm proud of you? I, I'm so proud of what you're doing. You know what, that, how that elevates and lifts people's spirits? I'm going to tell you, when a teacher tells a student, hey, I'm really proud of you, man, that student's going to try harder again next time. That's the way it works. When you're an employee, I, hey, I'm proud of you. And, and with your kids, I don't care how old they are. They still need to hear that, hey, I'm really proud of who you're becoming. Now, I want to be clear on a hope dealer. Don't lie. Don't be false and disingenuine. All right? I'm not saying, hey, you know, don't go, hey, great job, when <laughs> it wasn't a great job. Or, hey, you look great when, you know, of course, er- every one of us in the room knows when they come out and say, hey, do I look good in this? Yes. <laughs> right? They're not a, right, anyhow, let's move on. Thanks, thanks for all you do. I can tell you put a lot of work into that. And as I said, I'm not, I'm not saying a hope dealer you need to lie or to manipulate But are you telling me you have people in your life, you can't find anything good in them? Are you telling me you're hanging out with people? I have yet to meet somebody that says, you know, I was with somebody that was really critical the other day, and all they did was point out my faults, and I can't wait to be like them. (laughs) Nobody wants to be that person. But you've all hung out with somebody that builds you up, that speaks into your life. Be that person. I've told you about my friend Christine. She reviews my sermons as well on a regular basis, sometimes when I ask her to and sometimes just because she wants to have fun. And uh, what I love about Christine is um, she can rip my sermon apart like that in ways you have no clue of. And I feel good about myself because she has this ability to speak words of feedback and criticism to me that have built me up rather than tear me down. That's, that's a hope dealer. You think about it, what Paul has been telling us to do throughout the New Testament as you read his letters, God loves you. Now live that way. Become more like Christ. God isn't looking to find fault with you. We talked about that a few weeks ago with that angry God. That's the mentality a lot of us have. God's not looking to find faults with you. God's not up, God's not up in heaven with that checklist going, <laughs> Randy did this this week and this this week. And God doesn't have a running list of all your issues. God is not. And listen, what if every time you went to God in prayer, God said, well, I'm glad you're calling today. It's been a while, hasn't it? You only seem to call when it's trouble. What do you need now? Right? Aren't you glad that when you, when you go to God in prayer, you come to worship, God doesn't go. <laughs> right? One of my favorite moments when a guy came to church for the first time, and unfortunately his friend let me know that he was coming, and he was really nervous about being in church because he was convinced he was going to burst into flames. And he walked in the church, and I kind of walked up beside him because I recognized that he was new, and I kind of figured him put two and two together. And I said, John, I'm Scott. I'm the pastor. Glad you're with us today. I said, Leslie told me you'd be coming. He goes, yeah, yeah. I said, so far, so good. And he goes, what, what do you mean? I said, well, you haven't burst into flames yet, but we have fire extinguishers, right? <laughs> he was convinced God's just looking. That is not who God is. God 
loves you. Now, that doesn't mean God's not aware of your sin, but God's not up there condemning you because of your sin. See, God's not pointing out how bad you are. I believe God sees how good you can be and calls you to that. Maybe God has a lot of Miss Gilly in my head. Hey, Scott, you're good. You, you, you can do this. That's not who you are. This is who you are. That's who God is. And so we're called to give words to build up, to encourage. Words to give life. Last week I had the complaint jar for you. You can keep doing that if you want to, but it was, it was a one-week experiment. I'd, I'd like for you to stop complaining as much, you know, and kind of work on that. Uh, for me, like I said, I'm $11 that I'll be giving to uh, 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 resources for women. This week, I, I want you to do a compliment jar. I, I'd love for you to get a jar that says every time you give somebody a compliment, every time you use words to build somebody up, every time you say, I'm proud of you, every time you say, hey, I love you, every time you say, good job, every time you, every time you lift somebody up, put a dollar in that jar and then go spend it on yourself next week. You can bring it to church if you want to do that and be, you know, or just go, you know, because what I want you to do is I want you to start training yourself. Say words that build up. Say words that encourage. Give, be a hope dealer. Deal it out to people. Just make it your job to make people, and they walk away from you go, man, I feel good. Because that's how the world changes. Thinking back, all the people that have spoken into my life, those people that have been critical and beat me down constantly, I don't listen to that voice very well. And I don't change much because you keep beating me down. If anything, and this is just my personality, the more negative and critical you become with me, the more I'll dig my heel in the ground and go, watch this. But when you speak words of hope and truth and love, it begins to open up my ears in new ways. And I hear things because I like that. And I believe when I hear those words coming out of your mouth that you care about who I am. So be a hope dealer. And train yourself this week by putting some cash in a jar because you know you're going to enjoy that gift at the end of the week. And if you really want to go buy yourself something nice, Start dishing out a lot of hope to people. Last week I wrote a prayer and some folks said, hey, we like having a prayer to end. So I thought we'd come up with one this week. Uh, let's pray this together. God, I can be a critical person. Help me not to be a fault finder. God, work on my heart. Stir my soul that you would help me see the power of my words. Help me to see that my words have the power of life and death. May I be a life giver with my words. I pray that there would be no unwholesome talk coming out of my mouth, but only words that build up encourage, words that give hope. Everywhere I go, every word I say, may they be filled with hope. Help me to represent the living hope of your son, Jesus, with my words. As you come forward for communion today, God's not looking to find fault with you. God's not up there going, oh, really? Instead, God says, man, you're good. And I'm looking forward to all the hope you can give this week. As you come forward for communion today, hear words of love and grace. Every time I come forward to communion, I hear within my head, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are knit together in your mama's womb by a loving creator. Coming forward to communion, as I hear God saying, you are welcome, you are loved, you are good. And there's something about in that moment that I want to leave from here and share that with people around me. And so my prayer for this week as I come forward for communion is, God, as you fill me with hope, as you haven't condemned me for all my shortcomings, may I go do the same to the world around me. Because of the night in which Jesus gave himself up, he took bread. 
gave thanks and gave it to the disciples after he broke it. He said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took a cup. He gave thanks unto God, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you should drink of it in remembrance of me. And so today we come in remembrance of all that God has done for us. Come in remembrance of all those times you've experienced God's love in your life, where God made you feel welcome, loved. And sometimes you may look back and go, hey, I don't I don't remember God doing that, but there was this hope dealer that God used. Somebody that spoke words into your life that made you realize you were loved and that you were valued and that you mattered. Come in remembrance of that. And when you experience that love and that grace again, that world needs it. Less critical, more encouraging. Let's pray. God, we just pray that you pour out your spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of the bread and the cup and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That as we feast on them, we might experience your love and your grace. And may the words we use reflect the love you have shared with us. May the words we use bring hope and healing. And forgive us for those moments where we think we know better. And we need to let others know as well. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let me